Hi, Sir David. We have a burning question for you. Firstly, many congratulations. We feel passionate about incredible career. <laughs> Hello, Sir David. It's David Beckham here. Firstly, many congratulations on the new film. You have done so much to open all our eyes to the issues facing our planet. Your programs make us care about the natural world and what we need to do to protect it. You have traveled the globe many times over learning about nature. If you had one message for our children about the future of our world, what would it be? to look after the wild world with which we are a part, to care for the animals that you see. Don't waste things. Don't waste food. Don't waste electricity. Look after the natural world. It's the most precious thing we have, and we are a part of it. Hi, Sir David. It's Billy here. I wanted to ask you, how do you cope with your personal feelings about all the animals that are losing their lives and or going extinct? How do you actually deal with that as a human being? I don't know. I, I don't understand. I don't know how. You feel desperate. Um, I think the most uh, astonishing sight in the natural world that I've ever seen um, and one I shall never forget, the first time I dived on a coral reef. You go into a new world, and it's a world of extraordinary beauty and complexity and wonder. You see all kinds of wonderfully colored fish that lots of creatures you don't even know exist. The most rich, the most beautiful, the most varied sight in the whole of the natural world. And I went to almost exactly the same places when I first saw that on the Barrow Reef. And instead of that pageant of life, it was like a cemetery. It was stark white. It had died. It had been killed. And it had been killed by the rising temperature that we, humanity, have created. That was a terrible sight and a terrible vision of what we are doing to the natural world not only in the sea, but on the land and in the air. Hello, Sir David. I'm Trish. I am Asa. And I'm Kido. And we're the cast of Sex Education on Netflix. We feel a disconnect from nature is one of the reasons the planet is the way that it is today. So we would like to know how you think people can reconnect on a budget. It is amazing how much the natural world can come into our cities. Most of our cities, thank goodness, have parks of one kind or another. And there are many parts of the country that are wild parts uh, that have been put aside as, as little corners in which nature can flourish. And you would be astonished at how much stuff you can see there, how many different kinds of butterflies, how many different kinds of birds. Oh, and what is your favourite tree? <laughs> well, I'm very lucky. I live in West London, quite close to a wonderful park, uh, Richmond Park, which is uh, many centuries old, uh, and it was... Uh, Henry VIII's hunting park, and there's still deer there. And there are also a lot of ancient trees, a lot of ancient oaks. And when they get old, they go hollow, and they become the center of a whole group of different creatures. Wonderful stag beetles, which are there and fly into my garden. But this particular tree is certainly seven, eight hundred years old, maybe a thousand. So it's, it's a marvelous tree, and I look at it every morning, and I go through, not at it, how to do, you know, it's a great character, that tree. Hi, Sir David, it's Maisie Williams here, and it's a pleasure to be connected, albeit through the internet. Um, I have a question for you. Given the current travel restrictions, how can people better connect with nature? During this recent year, uh, months of the uh, of this lockdown, I've been spending more and more time in the garden and realising what riches there are. But apart from that, I've got a little pond. And I've got dragonflies, wonderful dragonflies. At least half a dozen different kinds come to that pond. And they're, they're rather more difficult to see than birds, actually, because they move so fast and they're quite small. But when they settle, and particularly relatives of the dragonflies called damselflies, wonderfully blue, turquoise blue insects, 
of astonishing beauty and butterflies and and there are many more things too hoverflies and wild bees and uh, wasps and there's so much to see and so much that you will realize that you've never actually looked at before hi david it's me marcus rashford it's shocking to know that areas the size of a football pitch are being lost every second and my question to you is what's causing our forests to be cut down and how do we save them trees forests are very vulnerable very tempting for people who want to make a quick buck because they are easy money you cut the forest down and you sell the timber and then having done that the land that have been cleared you can plant soy you can plant palm oil which we in the west are used in such great quantities so we are responsible because of what we buy for the for the quick profit that people can get from their forests and it's crucially important that we remember that they are even more valuable than that because they are the most critical element in a whole complex of climate and rainfall and fertility that keeps the natural world going they're precious and they become more and more precious as in fact more and more of them are being cut down in order for quick profit so david you've told us so many things i don't know where to even begin but the melting of the ice cap in the arctic is there anything at all we can do now to halt its progression the north pole is actually not land it's water frozen water but the world's temperatures are rising and now it's possible during the summer to sail from one side of the americas back into the european waters across the pole but one thing is for certain the north pole in particular is warming ice is disappearing that will change human life in that the fact that we'll be able to move from one ocean to another across as it were the roof of the world Uh, but what it's going to do to wildlife and what it's going to do to our climate and our weather uh, are a lot of predictions some more frightening than others but i guess we're going to have to wait and see because it's coming we can't solve most of these problems by ourselves we depend upon one another and upon agreeing uh, and in a river the fresh water which is so precious is in particularly down in its near its mouth and the delta uh, it is so precious people depend upon it but it's controlled of course by what happened up in the headwaters so people in the headwaters can build a, a dam and take it all away from the people who are on the delta so who owns this the only way you're going to solve those problems is by international agreement between countries but the in one way in which you can do that is to work out the economy of it to put a price on these services that nature provides which we have to share among ourselves how that is done is a huge problem and what you've touched on is a problem as i've said in miniature of what faces the whole world because the time has come now when we can't just have our own selfish interests when we have to think of other people who are dependent upon which what we do that applies certainly to the rivers but it implies to everybody on the planet we have to work together we have to have international agreements we have to work things out